Hey there Dev Squad, Vertus here and welcome back to my Unreal Engine 4 Sequencer Beginner Course. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at how we can introduce you to the interface for Sequencer, covering a couple of the main things such as the timeline, the Sequencer window, and even as far as adding in actors into our Sequencer track on the timeline. There is a lot that we're going to be covering in today's video, and the main purpose of the video is to familiarise yourself with the interface, getting you ready to create some awesome cinematics and sequences inside of Unreal Engine 4. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into Unreal Engine 4. Okay, so now that we're inside of Unreal Engine 4, the first thing that we're going to do is create a simple project that we're going to be working with throughout this sequencer series. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and grab myself a third person project with the starter content in here, and I'm going to give this the name Sequencer Demo. Once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and create project, and from there we're going to be diving into Unreal Engine 4 and introducing you to the sequencer interface. So the very first thing that we're going to do in terms of using Sequencer is give you a little bit of a rundown to the viewport and how you can adjust that to turn it into a cinematic viewport that you can use for creating these cinematic sequences using Sequencer. Now generally when I am actually working inside of Sequencer I have multiple viewports. Like I said I have two. I have one for level editing and then I have another one which is my cinematic viewport which I'm going to be using to view all of my sequences from. Now if you want to get a second viewport inside of Unreal Engine it's really straightforward. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to the little drop down arrow here, I'm going to go to layouts and then from here we can choose how many viewports we're going to have and the position of them. Now I recommend you just go ahead and do side by side so using two panes just like this and what you're going to notice is on the left here we've now got a second viewport and this second viewport is actually just a wireframe. So what we're going to do is go ahead and change this to a perspective view, so it's very similar to the other one that we've got. So once we've changed it to a perspective viewport, what we're going to do is, with our viewport on the right hand side, what we're going to do is set this to a cinematic viewport. And what this is going to do is simply allow you to work with it inside of Sequencer, and you're going to notice you have these black bars. Now inside of here, you can do a couple further things. Because it is a cinematic viewport, sometimes you're going to want to have to do a little bit of framing. Now what I mean by that is, you can add in overlays which are actually going to point out different sections in your viewport. For example, if I go ahead and add a grid overlay on here, I can see exactly what's in the center, so I know what exactly what is the focal point. And when you're working with cinematics, sometimes you want to make sure things are dead center, and this is a great way to do it. And you've got a couple of different overlays that you can use, such as your 2x2, two two, your 3x3, your crosshair, and even your rebatment as well. Once you do dive deeper into Sequencer and creating these cinematic shots, these frames are going to become incredibly important. What you can also do is change a couple of things such as your action safe area, your title safe area, custom safe and your letterbox mask as well. We're going to be diving deeper into all of these different settings as we go deeper into the series. What you might also want to do inside of a cinematic viewport is remove the toolbar at the top here as it can be quite distracting because you're not really going to need to use any of this if you have your level viewport on the left hand side. So what we're going to do is we are going to go to the drop down arrow in the top left and once again what we're going to do is inside of here we're going to turn off show toolbar. Another little feature that you might want to use inside of here is show FPS and this is going to be great for checking the performance performance of the cinematics that you're creating. So if it's an in-game event, you want to make sure it's hitting that high frame rate constantly. And by having this FPS displayed on the screen, you are going to be able to do just that. And the last thing that we're going to be doing inside of our cinematic viewport is I'm going to be showing you how to go into your game view. So if we go ahead and press G, what that is going to do is it's actually going to get rid of all of those icons, the axes and all the wireframes and all of that good stuff. So you have a perfectly clear view of exactly what the player is going to see inside of the game. So it's going to ditch all of the editor feedback pieces. 
So that is everything I wanted to show you in terms of the viewport. You should now be in a place where you're going to be comfortable having multiple viewports, adjusting some of the settings to get the best view possible. We're also set up perfectly for creating some animation sequences inside of Sequencer. So now we've got our viewport set up, we're going to move on to the next section. The next section is going to be covering the Sequencer interface itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to our Cinematics tab at the top here. And inside of here we can add a Level Sequence and a Master Sequence. We also have the option for a Matinee as well, but that is essentially the old version of Sequencer that isn't really used anymore. The layout is completely different, but it does very similar things. If you want to learn about that I do actually have matinee videos over on our website. But for now, let's just look at the sequencer stuff. So in terms of a level sequence, as it says, create a new level sequence asset and place an instance of it in this level. So like I said, it's going to place an asset in this level and you can directly change all of the stuff in this level as well. With our master sequence, this can go anywhere inside of Unreal Engine, it's going to get saved inside of your content browser and you're going to be able to bring it into any level that you like. A master sequence is typically going to be used for going in and stitching together multiple shots and these multiple shots don't necessarily have to come from the same camera and you are going to see all of this come to life as we do go into this series. So what we're going to do for now is we're going to create a level sequence and we're going to be doing it inside of this third person example map that we've got and then what we're going to be doing is creating a new folder called cinematics and this is where we're going to be storing all of our sequencer information. We're going to be giving this the name master and then sequence and then once we've done that we're going to go ahead and hit save and as soon as you do that what you are going to notice is your cinematic viewport you are now going to have all of these tools at the bottom to play go reverse go to the end and so on and so forth what you will also have is a sequencer window that looks just like this now, generally when you're working with Sequencer, you are going to have this on a second monitor if you have it, or if you don't, what I like to do is grab it by the little tab here and then dock it down to the bottom where my content browser is. And that way I have a nice stretched out view of my timeline. So the first thing you're going to notice with Sequencer is because this is a sequence of events essentially, we are going to have a timeline. And what you're going to notice is on this timeline, we have all of the different frames and we can go through this. So first things first, we have got our selector, which is this big red icon here and I can drag it backwards and forwards to go through my sequence that I've got. We've also got our time or the frames at the top here so we can see exactly how far through the sequence we are in terms of frames. Now, in addition to this, we also have our start and our end time. So our start time is going to be in green here. And as you can see, we have this little green line and I can move it backwards and forwards to adjust this. So if I wanted to, I could start this at frame zero and then I can adjust my end time at any position that I want, as long as it is after the start time. And I can do that using this red line that I've got here. And when we're working with our little playback here, it's only ever going to play the events which are within the start and the end time. And you don't necessarily have to just change them on the timeline here. You can also change them using these two little numbers in our cinematic viewport. So we can click the green text here and we can just move that backwards and forwards. And we can do the same thing for the end time as well. Just select it, move it backwards and forwards. And you can see that being shown on our cinematic viewport here with the start and the end as well. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm actually going to set the start time back to zero so we have a nice clean slate and then we're going to set the end time to 100 so it's going to have 100 frames for this. Now what you're going to notice is this is currently set to 30 frames per second and because we've got 100 frames we are going to be looking at about 3 seconds to go through all of this as you can see there. 
Moving on from our timeline, we next have our toolbar. Now this little toolbar, we can see it here, and it has a whole bunch of tools that we're gonna to be using to control our sequence. Now what I'm not gonna do is go through each and every one of these one by one, as we are gonna be using these in detail as we go through the series. Some of the common features that you're gonna use is things like save, search, and we even have our rendering tools, or you can even change the FPS if you want to. But like I said, don't worry, have a quick read through them, but we will be using these as we go through the series. Moving on from here, what we also have is our tree view. And this tree view is essentially going to show us all of the different tracks that we're going to be able to have. So if we go ahead and hit plus track, the big green button in the bottom left here, we can add an actor to the sequence to then create a track with it, or we can create one of the default tracks here, such as fade track, shot track, audio track, event track, and more. What I'm going to be doing for the sake of this video is I'm actually going to be selecting an asset in my scene, and I'm going to get this little cube here. And as you can see, it's called Cube Mesh. And if I wanted to add this into my timeline so we can actually sequence this, all I've got to do is go to plus track, actor to sequence, and then we are going to search for Cube Mesh. And with this Cube Mesh in here, you can see by default, because it is a 3D asset, what I can do is add a transform track, which it has done for me. Inside of here, I can adjust the location, the rotation, and the scale, and I can create various keyframes for this. So let's go ahead and work with a location timeline to begin with using sequence. So what we're gonna do is, like I said, we're gonna be showing you how all of this works, but we're gonna be breaking it down into the timeline. So we're gonna be showing you how to plot keyframes on it and essentially give you a broader overview of how sequence series going to work. So with this cube, what we're gonna do is go to our start point and we're gonna do that by using the selector and we're gonna move this down to zero. And then we've got our default location, which is set here. And then if we add a new keyframe for the X, the Y and the Z, we are then gonna have our starting points. If we then move our selector to the end point, we can then create a second keyframe, which is essentially going to tell the engine, this is where this item needs to end up, or this is what the property of this should be at the end of this sequence. So if I was to go ahead and select our Y, as you guys know, is the green selection, and then move it all the way over here, I can then create a keyframe for that at that position. And all I did was just add a new keyframe. You can just manually type it in, but if you do move it and add a new keyframe, that is going to work too. Now what you are going to notice is you are gonna have a line going across this track showing you where it's going to start, where it's going to end. And if I was to go ahead and move my selector now, you can see that sequence that we have just created. So if I go ahead and set this to the beginning, hit play, we can see this object is gonna move over those three seconds throughout our sequence. So hopefully guys, that is a better introduction to sequence and you're gonna have a basic familiarization with how it's going to work. What we still do need to do is over the series, introduce you to things like shots, the different tracks that you can use and all of that good stuff. But everything for now, that is it. Once again, thanks for watching. Stay awesome, keep creating. Your boy Virtus. Signing out.